Well, turn with me in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, and we will just be reading verses 6 and 7, which are the text we'll be thinking about for the sermon. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Will you pray with me? Lord God Almighty, now we have just sung that it is by grace alone that we can do anything at all. And Father, we confess that it is true that, Lord, we need your grace every waking moment. And Father, to hear your word rightly, to have your word not only fill our minds, uh, but affect and change our hearts. We need your grace, Lord. We need the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit. We need you to come and do something supernatural are working in us to will and to do according to your good pleasure. So please come now, Lord. Speak with power into our lives that we might indeed walk in Christ, abounding in thanksgiving. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the reason that I thought we'd spend a little bit of time working through these verses is that as Christians, uh, we tend to lose sight of the basics. Uh, We forget, don't we? Life wears us down. There's a trend that I often see in my own heart, and I suspect plays itself out in many of your hearts as well, uh, that you get busy in life. You get distracted. Uh, You get caught up in other things. And slowly over time, our faith is replaced by works. Joy is replaced by duty. Our deep spirituality is replaced by dull pragmatism. Uh, If you remember when you first became a Christian, or the moments of particular closeness to God, Uh, Christ was so valuable to you. Uh, You could confess not only from your mind, but from your experience that nothing in my hands I bring, simply to your cross I cling. Uh, You saw with a deep clarity that salvation must be all of Christ and nothing of you. Christ's righteousness, Christ's life, Christ's death, Christ's resurrection. Uh, Christ from beginning to end. Uh, You tasted something of that freedom, that liberty, that joy of realizing that Christ has done it all. That when Christ said it is finished, he meant it. But slowly over time, just like the sea erodes away the beaches and the cliffs, so life, busyness, stresses, bills, Uh, eroded away some of that glorious liberty, that joy, that freedom you had in Christ. And radiant Christian joy was slowly replaced by dull Christian duty. And these verses before us are really a call to come back to the childlike simplicity of the gospel, to come back to the basics to come back to grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Now these verses are really the book of of Colossians in a nutshell. Uh, What we're called to, why we're called to it, and how or in what manner we are to do it. And so the first thing that we see in these verses before us is what, what God is calling us to. Now in Colossians, Paul is writing to a church that is under assault. Now you can see that in verse 4 and then down again in verse 8. Now this church is in danger of being deluded with plausible arguments, in danger of being taken captive 
by empty deceit and philosophy. Now, there's a subtle manipulation of the gospel happening in this church. Error veiled as truth. And at its core, this error was the Jesus plus gospel. That what you really need for a victorious Christian life is Jesus plus. Jesus plus good works. Jesus plus some sort of special experience. Jesus plus some hidden knowledge. Now these false teachers were really claiming that you start with Christ, but then you graduate to something better. Now they weren't denying that salvation is by faith in Christ. They were saying that's true, but that's primary school. Now you get in by Christ, but you stay in by knowing enough, by doing enough, by experiencing enough. Christ is the door, but once you've walked through that door, you don't need it any longer. And you do have to wonder whether Satan continues to use that same script today. Now the simple gospel of Christ crucified and raised is great for Sunday school, as appropriate for non-Christians, but I know all that. I've actually moved a little bit beyond that now. Right now it's about knowing your careful theological distinctions, all your different isms. Now, now it's about coming to t- church twice on a Sunday. Now it's about the discernment to be able to look down on other churches. Christ plus. And to such sanctified wisdom, Paul says, nonsense, garbage, bogus, false gospel. Right? You never move past Christ and the cross. You never graduate from faith alone and Christ alone. Right? The whole book of Colossians is really a careful demolition of this nonsense. Paul's saying that such teaching is the height of folly. All it shows is that your view of Jesus is far too small. It's like trying to add to the ocean with a cup of water. The Christian life isn't about moving beyond Christ. No, it's about digging deeper into Christ. So here God through Paul is calling us back to the basics. That actually if you have Christ, you don't need anything else. There's no Secret wisdom, no clever little codes that unlock the Christian life. No, there's Christ. And if you have Christ, you have everything. And so if you look down with me at verse 6, Paul gives us the what of the Christian life, how to hold fast as a church. As you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. So what are we called to do? Well, we're called to walk in Christ. What does that mean? Well, a few observations. Firstly, notice that it implies something active on our part. It doesn't say sit down in him. It doesn't say lie down in him. No, it says walk in him. And walking is something active, isn't it? Now, this verse is calling us to actually do something. Second observation, that word walk has only been used once in the book of Colossians so far. And that's in chapter 1 and verse 10. Now, if you look there with me, it says, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. So if Paul's using that word walk in the same way, which is likely, then it means living all of life to the glory of God. It means that to have every square inch of our lives submitted to the lordship of Jesus. It's about bearing fruit, about obedience, about growth. He's saying you received Christ, now walk in him. It's a little bit like, if you imagine, uh, going down to Rebel Sport and buying a brand new pair of sneakers. And as you buy that new pair of sneakers, they're brand new, shiny clean, There's still that shade of white, which never seems to last. And just like you went down and you bought that pair of shoes, you bought it for a reason, for a purpose. You didn't buy it to put it on a shelf. No, you bought it so that you could go running or walking or tramping or whatever it is. 
Uh, buying them wasn't the end. No, it was just a means to an end. The end is that you would walk with them. And Paul's saying actually the same is true. That now that you've got Christ, get walking. The purpose is not merely to receive him, but that actually you would walk in him and live all of life to his glory. And the third and probably most significant observation is that if you look down at what Paul says, he says that we're commanded to walk in him. That we're not commanded to walk like him, although that's true, but rather in this case, Paul says we're to walk in him. Now you might remember that actually Paul's preferred term for a believer isn't Christian. No, Paul's preferred term to describe a believer is somebody in Christ, somebody united to Christ by faith. And so the call here is that we are to live, we are to conduct ourselves as those who have been united to Christ. Now we'll get into this a little bit more in the second point But what that means is to live in the reality that there's a very real sense in which we've died with Christ and we've been raised with Christ to newness of life, just like Calvin read for us. That as a Christian, you now share in Jesus' resurrection life. And so to walk in him means to walk believing that to be true. Living how you would live if you knew that that the power of sin had already been broken in your life. How you would live if you knew that the guilt of sin had already been done away with. That you had already been forgiven, already been adopted into God's family. Because of course you have. That you're called to a new type of living. Walking in Christ. And so the very simple point Paul's actually making is that you don't move past the gospel. You don't graduate from Christ. No, as you received him as your all in all, so you now walk with him as your all in all. As Christ from A to Z and beginning to end. So what are we to do? Well, we're called to walk in Christ. Why? On what basis? Uh, What's the foundations for this new type of living? Or it leads us to the second, which is why? And if you look down, Paul goes on to outline three reasons of why we are to walk in Christ. We are to do it because Christ is the soil in which we grow, because he is the foundation on which we are being built, and because he is the established truth we were taught. Now, these aren't three things we're called to do, but three things that are actually already true of every Christian. And the first basis for us to walk in Christ is that he is the soil in which we've been planted. Now, look down at that phrase, rooted in him. And it's really the picture of a plant, maybe a flower or a tree or a bush. And we all know the the way a plant works, don't we? That with a plant, you've got what's above the soil, and then you've got what's below the soil. And all the growth and the foliage, or that's not how you say it, but all the, there is a word, but it's just absolutely eluded me at this very moment. But all the flowers, all the veggies, everything that works in a plant is because of the roots that are under the soil, the part you can't see. Right? That's how a plant works, that it draws life, draws nutrients uh, from the soil, and because of that, produces whatever's visible to the eye. And Paul's saying that actually the same is true for the Christian, that actually every beautiful flower of Christian love or Christian patience, every harvest of Christian compassion or Christian forgiveness, is because you've already been rooted in Christ. That Christ is the soil in which you have been planted. That you draw your life, you draw your nutrients from him. That that's already true of you. That Christ is the soil in which you've been planted, and then he is also the foundation on which you are being built. Right? He says, rooted and built up in him. And that expression, built up in him, uh, Paul uses a number of other times, and each time he uses to talk about building on the foundation of the gospel. Uh, Near our house on Botany Road at the moment, uh, you might have noticed that they're building a big retirement village and all these other apartments. 
and we've been slowly watching it progress over the last year or so. And of course, what they're doing at the moment is that they're laying foundations. And we know how they do that, don't we? That they level it out and they put on the concrete and all the rest. And it's always surprising that they take longer than you would expect on the foundations. And the reason, of course, is that the whole building rests on the foundation. And that if there's an issue with the foundation, then it doesn't matter how beautiful the building, it's unsafe and unusable. And so they often take longer than you would expect. A building is only as strong and stable as the foundation it's built upon. And Paul's making the point that Jesus is not only the soil on which we grow, but he is the foundation on which we're being built upon, individually as Christians, together as a church. And it's a little bit harder to see in the English, but that word built up uh, has really the idea of continued growth, a building that is being constructed, that of course a foundation's vital, but the purpose of a foundation is that you build on it. And Paul's saying actually the same is true for you. The church is built on the foundation of the gospel, and now the church is supposed to grow on that foundation, grow in maturity, grow in knowledge, grow in love, grow in prayer, grow in witness. That we're to walk in Christ because he is a secure foundation for our lives. And so when earthquakes come, And the building shakes. You can know it won't come crashing down because you're built upon a foundation that will never crack, never erode, never let you down. Right? We often sing as a church, don't we? On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. You see, in your life, many things around you may fall. Life may bruise you and scar you. The church might let you down at times. Christian friends might disappoint you. But Christ, the foundation, will never falter, never change, never disappoint. So Christ is the soil on which we grow. He is the foundation on which we are being built. And he is the truth in which we are established. If you look, he goes on to say, established in the faith, just as you were taught. Now you might be aware, if you know your New Testament well, that when Paul talks about the faith, he's talking about the gospel, right? The content of biblical Christianity. Faith is something you do. The faith is something you believe, content. And Paul's saying, actually, you've been established in Christ and the gospel, right? This is what you were taught from the very beginning. Now, this is no strange innovation. People constantly try and innovate upon the gospel, They constantly try and find some clever new angle that unlocks the Christian life. But we should never try and be more original than the apostles. And they told us, Christ, Christ, Christ. I mean, hopefully that's what you were taught when you first became a Christian. That actually you can't do anything. And Christ has done everything. That your sole confidence is that Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus rose. Now you don't graduate from the gospel. That we walk in Christ, we live as those united to him on the basis that he is the soil in which we have been planted. He is the foundation on which we are being built and he is the truth in which we are established. And finally, how? In what manner are we to walk in Christ? Well, look at what Paul says established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. That just like we season our meals with salt and pepper, so every part of the Christian's life is to be seasoned with thanksgiving. And it actually makes perfect sense that Paul would say this. For if the Christian life is simply do better, do more, get your act together, then there's little cause for thanksgiving. But if the Christian life is that Jesus has done it all, Jesus is your all, and Jesus will do it all, then you have every reason, not just to give thanks, but actually to abound in thanksgiving. Now the reason we are to abound in thanksgiving is that in his son, God has given us something that we better than we ever imagined. Not just a door to walk through, but soil which 
nurtures our life, a foundation which will never disappoint us and a truth that will never change. And of course, thanksgiving is more than just kind of vaguely feeling blessed or feeling happy, right? A non-Christian can do that. No, it's to be thankful to God, to consciously, deliberately connect the blessings in your life to his love and to the grace of the gospel, right? To use the language of James 1, it's to be consciously aware that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. And so Paul seems to imply here that thanksgiving is a good gauge of how well you understand the gospel. That's pretty convicting, isn't it? Thanksgiving is a good gauge of how well you understand the gospel. That actually a a lack of thanksgiving, a thankless life, reveals a deficient view of Jesus, a deficient view of the gospel. You see, as a Christian, as one united to Christ, you always have abundant reason to give thanks. You won't always be happy. You won't always be comfortable. You'll still go through valleys and through storms and through battles. But even there, you have reason to give thanks. For you have Christ, and because you have Christ, you have everything. You have been planted on the rich soil of the gospel, being built upon the foundation of Christ, established in the truth. You've passed from death to life. You've been forgiven, adopted into God's family. You've received Christ Jesus the Lord. And so maybe a question that this text would ask of us is how full is your tank with thanksgiving? What does that gauge read? Full tank? Quarter tank? Orange light on? As you walk each day in Christ, abound in thanksgiving. For you have Christ. And because you have Christ, you have all. And so here in these little verses, Paul is taking us back to school, back to our ABCs. What's the Christian life? Well, the Christian life is walking in Christ, living our lives as those united to him by faith. Now, why are we to walk in Christ? Well, because he's the soil in which we grow, the foundation on which we're being built, and the truth in which we've been established. How or in what manner are we to walk in Christ? Well, we're to do it abounding in thanksgiving. The Christian life is not Christ plus something extra, No, it's coming to believe more and more deeply what you believed when you first became a Christian. So here in these verses, Christ is calling to us. And he's saying to you, come back to the childlike simplicity of the gospel. Come back to the basics. Come back to Christ alone from beginning to end. You never graduate from the gospel You only go deeper and deeper into it. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we do thank you that having given us Christ, you have given us everything. And Lord, we openly acknowledge that we do not fully understand that. And we cannot grasp what it is to be in Christ, to have you as our God and to know that we are truly your people But Father, we give you thanks. Thank you that you have given us Christ and thank you that in him you have given us everything. Thank you that he is the soil on which we have been planted. Thank you that he is the foundation on which we are being built. And thank you that he is the truth in which we are established. And Father, we pray for each and every one of us here this morning. And we pray that you would help us that having received Christ Jesus the Lord, that now we would walk in him, abounding in thanksgiving. Give us joyful hearts and singing lips, Lord. Give us a deeper appreciation of the unfathomable riches of Christ. And may we only dig deeper into him. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.